professor, my archaeology professor, um, you know, was there. He took me archaeology in my master's course, and I love archaeology. And he was the one who, who told me that if he had to publish an archaeology book, he would probably use some of the things that I wrote. You know, so I, I went to him. I said, this looks like an examination, you know. Um, I feel I'm going to be judged and everything. He just smiled. Nice guy. He just smiled. I said, Manuel, you know, you do, do it the way you do it in your papers in class. I said, wow. Okay. So I'm going to be taking a bit of that. Um, looking at just one church from the book of Revelation. Let me see if I can share my slide um, quickly. I should be able to do that. Just, just give me a second. Let me... Let me share my slide. All right, while, while I'm doing, doing that, please uh, let all the, like, like we normally say in Europe, but let all the house mouse or house mice or house rats inform all the bush rats that they should come. Everybody come. Um, if you miss this class, you, you might have to go to YouTube. Uh, or somewhere to go and get it. Okay, you know, so I entitled it uh, What the Spirit Says to the Churches. And it's a simple study, very simple study uh, from Revelation chapter two and three. And I actually like, like this archway. I, I took this picture you're looking at. It. That, that was Sardis. When we went to Sardis and we had to go, go through this archway into the Agora. And I, I really like the, the, you know, the, the, the perspective. That he brings. So I see, I see myself looking. It's kind of dark in the beginning, but when you go over there, it's going to be like, so what is the Spirit saying to the churches today? What is the Spirit saying to um, Ikeja region today? What is the Spirit saying to um, the church in Lagos, the church in Nigeria, the church in Africa? If God were to write a letter to us, what would he be saying? And that is what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, the language of Revelation is called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means to unveil. That's why in, in Igbo language, Revelation is, you know, it's, it sounds really good. Like, uh, uh, unless you are Igbo, you'll be able to pronounce that. Uh, it's to, 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 to un, un, unveil. Uh, it's like the, the, the way you open up a calabash. You know, so this revelation, and it's a style of writing. But when we're studying um, English, when we're being introduced to English uh, letter writing, we're told that there are types of letters, like there's a formal letter, there's an informal, uh, in, you know, le 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 letter. And, and when we talk about writings, what we are written, they are called, it's a French word. That French word is genre, genre. You'll probably hear it more today when you're listening to music. You say, oh, what genre of music is that? Oh, it's always oh, R&B, oh, it's reggae, it's bluegrass, which is, you know, country music, it's jazz, it's this and that. And, uh, and I just say that there's no genre of music called Christian music for your formation. <laughs> what makes the music Christian is basically the lyrics that you say. So you can put Bible lyrics or religious lyrics on any form of other genre, and it becomes like Christian jazz, Christian country, Christian... But there's no Christian uh, genre. So anyway, so Revelation is a style of writing. So in this style of writing, you use a lot of symbols. You use a lot of it's like anagrams. You look anagrams. You, you you know you you know you use symbols, and and you speak in a way in a in coded language where only the recipients will probably make sense of what you are saying. So in other words. If if an if if uh, if an enemy let's let's use that word if an enemy stumbles on that letter, they probably will not be able to make any sense out of it. So that's how Revelation was written. So Revelation also called those who have wisdom to think about, you know, the words that were you know written there, so that be able to make sense out of it. So it's very, very important, you know, for you to you know you know to have this background. The other background you need to know is that. When the, the, the letter of Revelation was written to the churches, churches were going through lots of persecution. It was not a very, um, it was not the, the glory days of the church. It was actually a very deep time where the churches were persecuted all over the place. Initially, of course, the Jews were persecuted because the, the Romans uh, saw the Jews as atheists. They actually called them atheists. <laughs> the Romans called the Jews atheists because they were asking them, so where's your God? You know, show us your God. They entered their temple. They didn't see any image, you know, like Apollo, 
like 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 Artemis, like like uh, like like Zeus, like Hades, or whatever. You know, so so they wanted to, you know, to to find out, and they believe that if you don't have that, then that means you don't believe in God. So where's your God? They say our God is in heaven. So where is he? There has to be an image, or not to them the image, you know, that our God has left down for the world is us. We are actually the image bearers of our God. You know, so the, the you know the Jewish community faced a lot of persecution. Then afterwards, there, there is now like a sub committee within the Jewish committee, which is the Christian committee. <clears throat> so at first, the Jews had one enemy, and that enemy was Rome. Then after a while, the Jews now saw the Christians as enemies, as as enemies of of Judaism, and so they were. It was easy for the Jews to sell out the Christians to the Romans. In fact, it was easy for the Jews to say, okay, you know what, we're going to follow Caesar. If you look at the story in the New Testament, in the gospel, you probably see that. We're going to follow Caesar, we're going to pay taxes. But these Christians, they, 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 are not, they don't align. So, so rather than us, you know, looking at all the nitty gritties and every single thing about it, it will pay for us to look at the big picture. The church was suffering. The church was being persecuted. And Jesus wrote them a letter. And the way the letter went, now we're not looking at the whole letter. I'm not only looking at the lesson, uh, you know, the, the, the message to the churches. Jesus, believe it or not, <clears throat> what he was saying was, guys, it's going to get bad. In fact, it's going to get really, really bad before it gets good. It's going to get really bad. Many of you will die. You will suffer. Uh, you're going to be betrayed. You'll be killed. You So many things before eventually. So my answer to your prayer is that it's going to get really bad before it gets good. I mean, what kind of answer you know, would that be? You know, but, but for Jesus to, to now show the, you know, the, 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 the church how he's going to deal with the enemies of the church, the, 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 the secondary enemy, you know, which was Rome and the other um, non-believers, the primary enemy is actually Satan. So said, before I show you what I'm going to do to, to you, to the enemies of excluding you, let's clean up the closets, okay? Let's clean up, you know, the church. You know, so he, you know, he dictated this letter, you know, to uh, John. And from chapter one, verse one, he said, the revelation of Jesus, uh, which God gave to him through his servants, um, you know, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant, John, who, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Then he says, if I say, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. So in other words, it is, everybody is expected to read it. It's a letter for all of the churches. Blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take heart, uh, and, and take heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So Revelation was written to comfort the, the disciples in that first century. You know, so if you agree with, with me, uh, that statement I just made, you, you, you also realize that most of Revelation, like maybe like 80 to 85% of the thing written in Revelation have already taken place. Most majority have already taken place. And it was written for disciples in the first century. And many of those prophecies have been as explained and taken place. So it's, it's said, you know, John said he was in the province of Asia, for the Asia Minor. Uh, there's Asia Major, this is Asia Minor. In fact, the region where these churches are, which is now modern day Turkey, modern day Turkey is like a bridge country. It's a, a country that has one leg in the Middle East, in Asia, then it has one leg in Europe. It's amazing. You have one leg in the Middle East, one leg in, in Europe. And of course, you know, um, it was um, the emperor of Rome, the first emperor of Rome who, um, who converted or who, who decided to side, you know, the Christian community. His name is Constantine, Constantine. So Constantine declared himself a Christian and declared the, the, the Roman Empire, the whole Roman world Christian. And of course, as the leader goes, everybody wants to go, everybody wants to become a Christian. They don't want to can they don't can the cause. In fact, Constantine himself, you can argue that he never really became a Christian. It was all through his life, he refused to be baptized. Um, he has some mean tendency, he killed his wife. It was on his deathbed, believe it or not, on his deathbed that he asked to be baptized. You know, so um, he declared the, the, the Roman war. So the city that he built, this is the second, um, we want to call it the second uh, capital of Roman world. The first capital was, was Rome. The second capital was 
where Constantine now moved to the east. He moved from the west, because that is the line they, they, they drew. He moved from the west and moved to the east, and he built a city in, in, in that, that place, uh, which is Anatolia, you know, and he called it Constantinople. Named it after himself, just like uh, Alexander the Great, you know, built a city, second headquarter, you know, from Greece, he moved it down to Alexandria in Egypt. So he too did the same. He felt that the, the Roman system where was falling, moral system is falling. He said, listen, man, I, I think I like these Christian guys. Let, you know, let me just deal with this Christian. I wish everybody was like these Christian guys. They are loyal, they are humble, they are they are very sacrificial and every single thing. So, but you know, I'll, Many years, decades, centuries later, people couldn't put, pronounce that word Constantinople. So it now became Istanbul. So that is where you go to talk today. Istanbul today, that is Constantinople. Now, it's sad to know that all of that area, most of the churches that mention the Bible, most of them, whether it's Corinth, whether it's Thessalonians, whether it's Colossae, Ephesus, uh, you know, all of them were in this in this same country called to the Turkey. But today, Turkey is a Muslim nation. So how has the mighty fallen indeed? All right, so um, so some little, little more um, background inside school about this. When you read Revelation, and when Jesus introduces himself to his church, it will be interesting for you to know that the titles that gives himself he it, it, it not just things he just came up with. They were actually titles of the Roman emperor. They were the titles of Roman emperor and every single thing. I mean, you know, Jesus has, uh, has always been like that. And uh, and uh, anything you consider that is like God, like whatever, Jesus came to make nonsense of, of those stuff. Uh, even as a baby, when Jesus was born, and this major traveled all the way from Mesopotamia to the east. They came all the way. Who was they looking for? They said they came looking for he who was born the king of the Jews. Now, unknown to them, that was the title of Herod. Herod had gone to Italy and he had asked the emperor if they can give him uh, a title. And the title he wants to be called king of the Jews. He himself was from, was an Edomite, uh, but he wanted to be called king of the Jews. So the emperor said, okay, you know what? You can go ahead and be king of the Jews as long as you're not the emperor. It's okay, fine. You know, so you can imagine when the Wise men came and said they are looking for he that is born king of the Jews. So that threatened his his authority and power. So the titles you are going to be saying, you know, Jesus used, used to introduce himself were actually titles that were held on. For example, in, in verse eight, in verse eight, where you know, when on chapter one verse eight, Jesus Christ told um, uh, uh, John, "Say, I am the Alpha and the Omega," says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Guess who again, who, you know, who was referred to as the first? Yes, you are correct. The emperor. In fact, the, the emperor, uh, you know, who calls himself, the, that's why even today, they, you know, they, they, they use that same title. The president is called the first citizen of, of nation, you know, the first citizen. Then the wife is called the first lady. So it, 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 was, it was the Greeks and the Romans that actually started that. So he's the first citizen. He's the alpha. And John said, no, it's, it's not that guy. I am the real alpha. In fact, I'm the alpha, I'm the omega. Everything just comes, I squash every single thing. Now, the, the first emperor of Rome was, um, um, was um, Julius Caesar. And, um, and, he, and, and he asked, uh, uh, when he died, his adopted son um, made him a god. You know, he, you know, his adopted son made him a god. And uh, and now because his foster father is not a god, so what does that make him? That make him that makes him the son of God. So the another title of the Roman emperor was the son of God. So you can imagine when Jesus came and said, "I am the son of God," he was also hitting at the Roman, uh, you know, the Roman, uh, you know, title and everything. You know, so um. John was in, on the island of Patmos, which is just, uh, you know, on southwest uh, of the, you know, you know, the coast of Asia, Minor. And he was there, the Bible says, he was there, was there on the Lord's Day. Now, which day is the Lord's Day? Now, for, for, for the Jews, um, the most important day for the Jews is the seventh day. That's the day that God rested um, from his work based on Genesis. And that's the day they are called to also rest. So it is the Sabbath day. 
And of course, you know, the, 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 the early church was almost predominantly Jewish. And, and they, they, it was a cultural thing. So you, you go to the Sabbath on the, I mean, you go to the temple on the Sabbath day and every single day. But a time came that they began to honor the first day of the week. What was it? The first day was the day that Jesus resurrected from, you know, from, 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 from the dead. It was also the first day that Jesus also ascended into heaven. You know, so they began calling it the lost day, the lost day. You know, so for example, in, in chapter chapter uh, chapter one of Romans, sorry, Revelation chapter eight, verse nine, he said, I join your brother and companion in sovereign of the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of the Lord and testimony on the Lord's day. So that's the first day of the week. And gradually, you know, the Lord's day became, became the, the day that the Christians will uh, gather together to worship. Will remember when they take the communion, when they come to take the, like the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 24 or so that says on the first day of the week or 22, we met to break bread. You know, so of course, when the Christianity, uh, when, 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 when Rome or Christianity became the official Roman, um, uh, uh, you know, religion, so the, the first day of the week was given um, credence, you know, it became like the, people say the Christian Sabbath. Okay, so it became like the day of, of, of rest so that the Christians, the whole empire can go and worship. You know, so um, John was told to write these things down on a scroll. So whatever he, he, he saw um, and every single thing, write it on a scroll. I have a sample of a scroll here. Um, you might not be able to appreciate okay, the scroll. This is actually papyrus scroll, papyrus. This is the earliest, it's from here we got our, our the word paper, papyrus, paper. Um, it is a reed that, that grows in, in Egypt. They, just like our mats, like the enemy, you will see them around Oroshoki um, Swamp. Uh, but this is a reed, and they will beat them, and the light, 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 light. So I, I got this one um, in Cairo, when I went to Cairo about uh, 15 years ago. And this is original uh, reed, and this is uh, hieroglyphs. This is the ancient you know, writing of the, this, and I, I don't have a certificate of authenticity that is original papyrus and also a price. So this is what kind of thing he must have been, you know, written, you know, written uh, the stuff in. So you write it only on one side, then you roll it up. So you can imagine the amount. So many of the things written on papyrus did not survive because papyrus is, um, is plants. You know, the, the ones that survived more were the ones that were, you know, written on animal skin. And of course, um, I've shared with you the discovery of the, uh, what do you call it, of the of the Dead Sea Scroll. A, a, a lot of fragments of papyrus, but the ones that survived were going on leather. And that's where we get our codex from. And the parchments, like the Paul we talk about, give me my parchments. Those are the ones that were, that were written on animal skin. You know, so on the last day, and here he said, write on a scroll, what you see and send it to the seven churches of, of uh, you know, to Ephesus, Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Tatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And Jesus Christ said, and, and, and the Bible said, when he turned to see what voice, I mean, he was he was in a trance, but in that trance, we were like, what, where's this voice, you know, coming from? Um, you know, you know, the, the, the Bible said that he turned and he saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands, someone came, someone like the son of man came. And, and that's one of the titles that, you know, Jesus, you know, you know, called himself the son of man. He was dressed in white robe from his feet, you know, all the way down. He had the golden sash and everything. And his, his head was white and, he, and, and his legs were like bronze. Um, I actually have bronze. This is what I'm wearing here, bronze. But I, I also wanted to show you guys some bronze coins that I got, um, ancient uh, bronze coins. You know, so he said his, uh, his feet was like bronze. And, uh, and, and he, told, he told him, I'm the first, I'm the last. And he told him that he's one who holds the key, the keys of death and Hades. Of course, you know, you know that the, the, the Greeks um, have this idea of Hades, the underworld. He said, I'm the one that actually holds the keys of death and I can do everything. So you can see everything that Jesus will tell them were things about him. He's saying, don't look at all the titles. Don't get carried away, whatever. It is I. You know, so seven golden lampstands. In in in, uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Manoah. I have a replica. I have a replica here. Solid, you know, you know, my metal, very strong. Um, a, a Manoah, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, a Manoah, you know, this is the star of you know David. 
um, it's the is a symbol of Zionism. All right, so so this is not in the original, you know, ma, ma, manoa, but this is how the original manoa looks like. You know, so this is in the temple, and it's massive. It's not tiny. It's very big. Uh, it took about how many Roman soldiers to to, to steal it? Uh, you know, when the, when 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 the Romans fought, you know destroyed Jerusalem, they stole the you know the, the manoa, and we don't know where it is right now. Some people believe that it was probably melted, um, you know, bronze. It was melted for money, but we 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 we, we found a picture of it. Now to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem and whatever, you know, there was there was a major architectural war that was dedicated to Titus. It's called the Titus uh, Aqua. It's still there in Rome, and right there they made a sculpture of the Romans carrying the the symbol of the Jewish, uh, you know, worship, which is the you know the, the Manoah away. And from that carving, that's how we're able to replicate. Though this is actually how the Manoah looks like. And you're going to see this. I, you know, I appear again several times in the book of Revelation, and Christ will threaten that I'm going to come and take away your light also. I'm going to come and remove your lampstand. If you remove your lampstand, you can't burn anything, uh, you know, there again. So I'm just giving you get the inside scoop so you can understand some of the things we're going to be talking about. So here is the island of Patmos. Let me get my pointer. Um, here's the island of Patmos. And so if, if a dispatch rider or a dispatch person is to go and send this letter out, the first place it will land will be Ephesus. So you see, even the way Jesus dictated the name, give us like a circum navigation, Ephesus, Spina, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Lao. So the Lao is here. So you have to read it round. You know, so this book of Revelation was first intended for the seven churches in Asia Minor. However, what is written inside is for all of us. Is also intended for all of all the churches of God, you know. And the conclusion of this is that God wants us to now there's a blessing upon anyone who hears it and anyone who keeps the word of this book, you know. So we are going to go, uh, you know, straight to some of those. So, but before we do that, let, let, let me point out, you know, so some of the churches out of this area. This is the area of Turkey today. You can see that, you know, Turkey bridge, bridge or bridges uh, from here to what is now called Europe. Uh, so from there, you can try to take a bus from where we are in Constantinople. You can try to take a bus down to Bulgaria, all those places. So you find some other churches that were very familiar, like Galicia, church in Galicia. Uh, you, you, you find church in Iconium, in Lystra, uh, in Pamphylia, uh, in Colosse. Okay, okay, Colosse there, there. So all these places where uh, Christian uh, um, uh, territories, but unfortunately lost to Islam. You know, so who is um, separate, uh, who doesn't care about us, even in our sin, God actually, he does. And I want to believe, I want to believe that with all my heart, God sees me, you know, we sing that song, Jehovah, Jehovah knows, Jehovah, he actually knows. God is saying, I see, I see your tears. You know, he's saying, you know, your prayers have come up to, to me and I'm going to act based on your prayer. And he's saying the death of, the, of, 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 of my saints are precious in my sight. And he said the final, <clears throat> your final destiny is going to be victorious. And God is saying that I will avenge you. And he's also saying that Christ is the one who is going to rule forever and ever. And Christ, by the way, is coming soon. So there, these are the other churches of the Asia Minor. And we are going to now step into the empire. Now, interestingly, the way the country goes, the, the country has a way, or rather the church has a way of reflecting the society where uh, it's in. The condition of the empire. Rome at this time was going through a lot of turmoil. Uh, there was, there was, Rome was struggling to maintain the Pax Romana, which I'm going to tell you very, very soon, Pax Romana. And, 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 and to maintain that, you need some strict laws. At this time, emperor worship was the main thing. Emperor worship was the main thing. Uh, the entire empire was called to worship Caesar as God or as a God. Worship Caesar. You remember the story of Daniel and, and, his, and his young friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylonia, where they, they were called to come and worship the, the image of the king. And it was only these young men that said, no, we're not going to do it. So imagine yourself being there in that time where you are called to worship and to make sure that people worship because if you say about okay worship you don't have to worship so what the em empire did or, or the emperor did 
was to now link the worship of the emperor to to what you eat okay <laughs> you know to what you eat and to what you think you know to your right right hand you know your 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 sustainability then on your forehead you know you know that, that's what what you bow down to what you think you know what you worship so that's why you're going to be saying things like the mark of the beast jesus also put a seal on his own servants he put a seal satan also will try to duplicate everything that that, that jesus does he too went to go and put a seal on his own on his own people on the right hand and of course it's not a physical seal so you won't see it anywhere and by the way it is not your qr code it's not your barcode uh it, it, these things are symbolic um in the new testament so what it did was to divide every every trade into guilds and now we, we still have that today you have the nigerian labor congress right uh within there you, you have the trade union within the trade union you have all kinds of whatever even in school uh we have the ATSA, arts design student association uh then when, when you finish uh your study you now come and join the sna the society of nigerian artists you know so that's the body today we have the medical guild you know we have the you know you know the you know the guild for 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 passes you have architectural guild even you know one of the most popular one is for, for accountants i can so if you don't belong you are not going to you, are, you won't have certification even as a coach you also have nigerian um, um life coach association of nigeria elkan then internationally you know you know we, we you know we, we, we also have the uh, uh you know international coaching federation icf you know so if you don't belong you are not going to be satisfied <laughs> You're not satisfied, you probably will not eat. So you see how it works. But when they're not created these guilds, one of the first things you do as your ceremony is that you must sacrifice to Caesar. And whenever they come together for their club meeting, they're, they're going to sacrifice to Caesar. They're, they're, they're going to take blood and, and they're going to eat the meat of that sacrifice together as a community. And, and, and that eating as a community is what binds people together. Even today, when we teach parenting, we're like, oh, uh, you know, try to have a meal with your kids. It's not the food per se. It is, it is what it represents. When you sit down to have a meal with someone, you know, you become bonded with that person. That is where you are very vulnerable. You know, you are, you are, you, you know, you affirm your friendship. You affirm uh, that's where, uh, you know, character is built and every single thing. So they were constantly having those celebrations. Come, let us eat together. So it won't, it won't surprise you that Jesus also had his own meal, which is called the Lord's Supper. So we'll come together. That's also when we embrace force. You know, so when you read the Bible, you, you, you'll find the disciples struggling about eating meat, sacrificed to idol. And in in, book, in in letter to Corinthians, Paul was like saying that, you know what? If you see meat in the marketplace on the outside, like, just buy Buy meat, don't, don't ask questions, just go. But the problem is people who actually go to the ceremony. That's what you say you cannot do. When you go to the ceremony, you sit down with them. They will not kill the animal. They will not make, make say all their prayers and every single thing. You will not eat with them. You are endorsing it. That is the one that disciples, are, are, you know, we are, we are told not to. Because you are saying that you are part of them. But, 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 but if you see the meat in the marketplace after they've, they've done their whatever, Jesus Christ said, you know, not what goes into you that defies you, but what comes out of you. You know, so the ways that, that the Roman Empire kept the whole empire in check, there were two things. One is military conquest. Rome, Rome is, was not known for large-scale agriculture or whatever. No, really. It's military conquest. They conquer you, and of course, you now begin to pay tributes. You know, you know, to, to, to them. And number two is the commerce. So they now open way. It's like Dubai, for example. It's like open a shopping mall. Come and set up shop. Whatever you sell, I get the commission. So that made Rome very rich. You know, so the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. So today in the world, um, if you say, what is the sign of peace? You probably will do this, right? Hey, peace. Just show me a sign of peace, peace. Th those are the two pillars you're talking about. The military and, of course, uh, you know, the commerce. So, so when, when you see one of some of those funny paintings of Jesus, uh, <laughs> that you see, you, you'll see somebody with a hand like this and he will do two hands this way. All this Catholic painting of Jesus. And you also see, you see the Pope, you see them doing like this. It is a past Romana, Roman peace. But today, you have it on your WhatsApp, uh, where symbol, okay, this is peace, peace to the world. This is, I love you. This is thumbs up, which is also Roman. Thumbs up, you live. This one, you die. Thumbs up, you live. 
then that you know, you know, you know, die. You know, so you, you know, Rome was doing that. So, how will a disciple now buy and sell? Because you, you, you cannot join those guilds. Because when you join those guilds, you have to sacrifice to Caesar, you have to partake in idolatry. So, you can't join, meaning that you cannot practice. That we cannot practice, you know. So that is how it now began to affect them. And many disciples, by the way, many the, the, the disciples fell away. Many disciples fell away because of the way to survive, and, and many denied the faith. And and so when you read the letter of Jesus to to these seven churches, you are going to begin to hear that. So you know, Christian Christianity was an exclusive religion. You know, they, they were they are the called out. They are the sanctified. You know, so there's some things they will not do. So people don't understand them. Everybody in the empire does the same thing. You know, um, you know, people worship many gods, you join them, whatever. But this one particular religion, and of course the, the Jews also, this particular religion seems to be exclusive, you know, in, in that way. So today, ask yourself, are you holding on to the, ex the exclusivity of Christianity? Are you still yoked to, you know, to the world? In a way where you are now the same thing. I'm not saying that you cannot enter a bus uh, that you know that has non non Christians there, or you cannot enter a play. I mean, in you know, how many pilots you know who you do disciple, or how many whatever you know you you can't say oh, I only go to school that disciples. No, Jesus Christ told his disciples that you are going to be in the world, but you are not going to be part of the world. Be in the world, but the other was insulate yourself. And how do you insulate your, yourself? It's like you taking um this pencil. I have a pencil here. Taking this pencil. How can you put this pencil in water? Not water. How can you I'm not do that? Doing this. How can you put this pencil in water without water touching it? Simple. Put it in a cellophane bag. Wrap, wrap it in a cellophane bag or in a ziplock. They can put it in water. You know. So disciples are to be insulated that way. Even though we are in the world, we are not going to be affected by things in the world. We can still operate in the world. We are not going to be worldly. We are going to be like we're in the world. So. When you look at those letters, those letters have about six segments. Uh, practically, you see salutation. He will greet them. That's how they wrote letters in those days. Salutation. Then he will describe himself. Just like describe himself. Then commendation. Uh, and, and it's good. Jesus Christ was very balanced. He will commend them. Even though there was one church that did not receive any commendation at all. There was nothing good Jesus Christ had to say about those churches. And there were two churches in, in Revelation that did not receive any rebuke. Okay, if you want to know, very short. It's only found in chapter two and three. You can get those choice. But I can give you the hint. The first one is, you have the word fee. <laughs> Philip, if you look, Philadelphia, fee, friend, friendship, fee, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, the church in Philadelphia. Now, so there's commendation, there, there, you know, you know, there's, there's also condemnation. Then there's an appeal and warning. Then finally, there's exhortation and a promise. So that is how the entire, the entire thing, uh, you know, let it go. So in, in, a, in, in one way, we can actually wrap up the, in one word or two words, or let's say one or two words, we, 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 can, wrap, we can sum up the, the lesson of how Jesus Christ saw these churches. Well, we're looking at the church in Ephesus today. I'm going to look at it. For George Ephesus, it was a loveless church. It was a loveless church. And you're going to ask, why was this church loveless? Um, before I, I, I go into that, let me introduce you to um, Ephesus. Okay, you know, that, you know that, that this was me uh, in Ephesus a few, few weeks ago. And um, let, let, let me please share a video uh, with us about Ephesus. I, I did several videos. I, I'm going to pick let's say one or two at intervals that I'm going to share with us. Just allow me, please. All right, let me share this. Um, I'm looking for a very short one. Okay, <laughs> let, 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 let me share this with you. All right, so just a quick um, update on uh, what I was saying earlier on. This is uh, Ephesus. And if you remember in the Bible, Paul had uh, a hard time uh, just really preaching here and getting people to think the way the God of heaven wants them to think. Uh, the most profitable business was a guild. 
that made little um, statues of um, Artemis, uh, which they claim the original statue fell from heaven. Um, probably it's true because uh, Mythos, uh, you know, fall, and there are so many religions today that are based on Mythos that's uh, from heaven. You, you can see when Paul preached that there's only one God and the God from heaven, you can imagine the the uproar that happened here, right here in the city, how he was dragged into to the city center. Uh, in the Bible, it was recorded that some people were shouting one thing and some were shouting another thing, and many don't even know where they are there. They were just shouting, they don't know where they are there. So, lesson is uh, there are a lot of things today people uh, kind of fight over religious beliefs and norms and everything, but they are not even, uh, they don't even understand what they are talking about. And uh, of course, we, you know, um, uh, you know, today, just, just a little bit. 150 years after that incident, or 200 years after the incident, will you believe that uh, the entire Roman, Roman province, the Roman Empire, uh, became Christian? And we are at the at the west side of the um, Roman Empire, Constantinople. Excuse me, Constantinople. And uh, this is the Byzantine era. And the Byzantine um, it was truly a Christian um, an empire. Uh, but, but that was history. Right now, what we have right now just ruins and remains of what was. And a question I always live with my students and those who care to listen is whatever we build today, will it stand the test of time? And even if it does, what will be? For what reason? We will say we did. So I'm going to go ahead and join up with some of my colleagues um, who are way back. This is the Agora. Uh, this is the, you see all the marbles, everything here is marble. A marble, they're all turned down. There are inscriptions on the wall, and I'm gonna be showing you, sharing with you um, the reason for those so many inscriptions all over the place, right after. All right, <laughs> sorry. I, I just have to stop, you know, stop there. Um, so, I, that, you know, that was um, Ephesus, and uh, you could see all those turned down, Robbers and every single thing. So the city of e e Ephesus um, has a theater. The theater uh, sits up about maybe 25,000 people or more. And uh, it, it, it had one of the ancient wonders of the world. And so people came all over the place to come and worship um, in that place. And if you remember your Bible story, this was where Paul uh, came to preach in that place in Acts 19, which we are going to be looking at right now. We're going to be looking at the riots in Ephesus, and I, and I want you to, uh, you know, to to join me, you know, in this exciting moment at this time. And I'm going to be showing you what caused that riot. This is what. Let me see. I'm not sure if you can. The lights. Okay. Yeah. So this is a replica of the statue of Artemis. Replica. This. This is um. Um, this is Mabo, um, the replica of the statue of Artemis. And the original statue of Artemis is over 447 feet tall, over 447 feet, like massive. And this was what was bringing them business, uh, really. You can see the chest. What do you have there? It's full of breasts, you know, really. Then you have the, the, you know, the honeybee, and you have all kinds of idol. I mean, it's intricate, all kinds of idols cast around it and so you can imagine them making silver smiths were making and they were worshiping it they were worshiping it and paul came to town paul came to town to come and tell them that listen this is not god and of course you know a lot of things that people call god today is just purely their business it's just purely business so i'm, I'm going to quickly read acts 19 but of course you know the beginning of acts 19 was when paul met these disciples who Maybe Apollos uh, had had some um, interaction with them, and and Paul came into this fellowship, and they looked like disciples. They sounded like disciples, but there was something about them. Paul asked them, "Did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believed?" He said, "No." He said, "Okay." So, what kind of baptism did you believe? Paul, they said, "Oh, John's baptism." Paul said, "Oh, that that figures is out." John's baptism was of repentance. He preached to them to believe in the one coming after John, which is Jesus Christ, and they were all baptized into the name of Jesus and everything. Now, but I want to start this story from verse 8 of Acts 19. Paul entered the synagogue. Paul was now in Ephesus. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there, that was it, for three months. 
he was arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became, uh, you know, obstinate. They refused, you know, they, they refused to, and they publicly maligned the way. Rather than just go around, they were now attacking Paul. So Paul left them. He left them alone. What did he do? He now took the disciples with, with him. And what did he do? He had enough began to have discussion in the library. In the library, in the, in the college, they, 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 you know, the, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. The lecture hall of, of you know, Tyrannus. So it was a public place. Well, anybody can come here. And uh, sometimes, you know, that, that is where we, we get our idea of campus Bible talk, you know, having, having, having a Bible talk, uh, you know, and he was, he was doing that. And Bible said in verse 10, he said, this went for two years. He was having daily Bible, Bible you, know, you know, Bible discussion. After he has gone to make, um, um, you know, tents, he was a tent maker, then he will close. During the siesta, actually, uh, you know, during the time of siesta, when people go, go to chill out, Paul will continue to walk. So he will walk from morning to the time of siesta, rather than go to go and sleep. When people now go to chill out, and whatever, that's where he will now start his ministry. He will now go there to go and now start preaching. So talk, talk about having a Bible talk. Uh, you know, you, you think you're having a hard time, you can imagine what Paul, you know, was doing. Now, there, the Bible says he did it for two years. In verse 11, it said, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even his handkerchief and apron, remember he was a, uh, you know, a craftsman, he made the, even the aprons he wore, uh, people would, would touch it, they'll take it to, to the sick, and they'll be, they'll, they'll, you know, uh, all kinds of illness will be healed. Now, you would think that somebody who brings so much good news will be loved. In verse 13, we know that some Jews who went around driving a evil spirit tried to invoke the name of Jesus. They also, they thought, okay, this is what they, they do with the Temple of Artemis, with Zeus, with uh, Aprovita, Ap Aproditis, <laughs> and so on. It's a, a tongue twister there. You know, so they also tried to drive out, you know, demons. And uh, some of them were the seven sons of Skiva, uh, you know, you know Skiva, who went and said, uh, you know, I, 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 I drive you out. And of course, the demons came out and said, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but who do you think you are? Who are you? You know, that the man who had the evil spirit, I would say, jumped on them, he overpowered them, and, and he gave them, I would say, such a pity, you know, that they ran out of the house. So even demons know us. Demons know fake. Demons know new, uh, you know, you know, real. Uh, you know, we are, we, are, we are told that of James, um, even, you don't just love with mouths. Yes, they are, you know, they are, they are evil deeds. So people began to confess their evil deeds. Bible said in verse 19 that a number of those who had practiced sorcery, they brought their scrolls together and they burned them publicly. You know, when they calculated the value of that scroll, the total, uh, you know, came to about 50,000 drama. That's some millions of dollars to do it. In this way, the word of God spread wide and grew powerful. Now, after all that happened, Paul decided to Go back to Jerusalem. Then you know. Then, then, then he sends for help for Timothy. So Timothy became the leader of that church in Ephesus. In fact, Timothy led that church in Ephesus. John the Beloved, who wrote Revelation, also was in that church in Ephesus. Now, about this time, there arose a great disturbance about the way a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, he made silver shrines. He brought in no little business. For the craft. In fact, this guy was a good, you know, crafts, you know, tradesman. He was bringing business for for, for for the trades people, and they were multiplying. They were just carving it, people and washing it. So he called together a lot. Remember, they were all categorized into guilds. The, you know, you have the, the the silversmith guild, the you know the sculptor guild, the painter guild, the fisherman guild. Every single thing. That was how Rome was able to control everybody to make sure that everybody worshipped, uh, you know, Caesar. Here they. The message that he prayed. He said, Men, you know, will receive a good income from this business. He said, What was that? He was, he, 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 he was there. He was um, uh, appealing to both their intellect and their emotion and also money where their greed is. He said, Guys, let me tell you this point blank. You know that this thing brings us a lot of business. They will say, yes, yes, make a lot, a lot of money. And you know that I'm, I'm the one that had the contract with whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he called together every one of them. He said, he said, he, you know, he said, you see, 
and hear how this fellow, he said, this fellow Paul, how he has convinced and led astray. In their eyes, Paul would lead astray. He has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. And in practically, he said, the whole province of Asia, which is true, really. The gospel has spread everywhere. If I has led astray everybody, what is that? He's saying that man made gods and no gods at all. He would ah, to fear one. It's impossible. They get now, look at what he said. Now, after he has appealed to their conscience, I mean, you know, sons of conscience to their greed and to their business and, and to their whatever. Look at what Nas said in verse 27. He said, There is danger. Not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess. Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped through all the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Oops. So you see, this is actually what is called rhetorics. This is how to make a very good you know, you know, rhetorics. We use this you know, method of speaking uh, in debates. Uh, you know, we will learn it in Toastmasters Club. You know, if you want to speak to somebody, if you want to get somebody's attention, speak to something they like. If, if you want to, if you want to beg a woman, use the son or the child. Speak to something they like. If you, if you want to talk to a politician in Nigeria, of course, talk to his greed. Hey, listen, I like contract or whatever, whatever. That's how to get people's attention. Now, before we go to what happened next, let me take you know, you know take, you know, take you to. Um, another short video um, about the place. Okay, let me just a, a, another you know short video live uh, that that I showed their life so that you be able to make sense of of some of these things. I've showed you the you know li, li, you know uh, li, li, you know li, library. Now let let us go to the um, amphitheater. Let's go to the uh, amphitheater. Then you will be able to now understand how big this place is okay that this is yeah in archaeology and in history one of the ways that we uh, determine the size of a city is obviously by looking at the gymnasium and the amphitheater uh, we are sitting in an amphitheater right now in Ephesus um, arguably the most preserved and I'm not even at the topmost level there's still a topmost level like steps all around and this can seat maybe over forty thousand people or so so you can imagine the entertainment much like what we have today with netflix um just the entertainment uh that this draws the people that come for so many um not just for recitals you know for arguments a place of meeting you know think about someone like apostle paul dragged into this place and people were screaming and shouting greatest Artemis of the Ephesians and um, and he was dragged because he was telling them that man-made gods are not gods at all uh, this is the beauty of this place massive just over there we have the uh, you know the, the, the harbor uh, that brings it so much so this is a beautiful city in its glory and the truth is that just about 10% of uh, everything was, that was here before um, has been excavated. So archaeologists are still working, mostly in the summers. Uh, that's when um, archaeologists work. Uh, it's a gruesome work, one of the most difficult uh, works. Uh, in archaeology, we call it a dirty work. Archaeology is a dirty work. And um, we just have to thank all the men and uh, women, volunteers, students, universities that dedicate their time to make sure that we excavate, then we study, we um, itemize all the little pieces of stones and uh, even coins, um, ancient coins that um, we found. These are some ancient coins. Um, you know, so it takes a lot of work, you know, to get all this done. Um, again, the Ephesus is an incredible, incredible place to be. All right, so that was Ephesus. So let's come for a landing. Uh, this is how we are going to do it. Let's come for a landing now. And um, we, are, we, are, we are going to go to what happened in Ephesus in um, chapter 19 of Acts in verse 28. So when they heard this, when they heard this argument, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We're not shouting. It sounds, I, I've, I've been where 
uh, some Muslims uh, try to mob somebody, or whatever, and they were shouting, La Hila, Hila, La, La Hila. You can imagine everybody. And I've, I've seen we even people on the streets all join in Lagos Island. You know, in Vasco, they said soon the whole city, the whole city was in an uproar. This is a massive city in the ancient world. There were over 200,000 people probably lived there, minus people who come to trade, come and go. The people seized Gaius and, you know, Aristobulus, Paul traveling companion from Macedonia, and they rushed as one man into the theater. That same theater I just showed right now, that was where they, you know, they, they, they rushed these two disciples into. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. But the disciples will not let, let's say, like, oh man, they, they will kill you. You don't know who these people are. You know, so when some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater because Paul, they will kill you. Don't go there. Then the assembly was in a confusion. Bible says some were shouting one thing and some were shouting another thing. And guess what? Most of people do not even know why they were there. So are you like that today? We see a, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, you know, things like, you know, like that. People don't even know why they believe what they believe in. I remember it was um, uh, 2000 and um, maybe six or five, six, five, when ShopRite, Lagos, um, uh, Ileki, the, the palms just, just began. You know, so there was a time they were selling this, this um, like conflicts and whatever in bags. You know, so what they were doing at that time that if, if, if some of those items were going to expire, like maybe like three, four months, they bring them out and they send them rock bottom. So when they open everything, of course, you know, without the pack, when they open everything, they were all in their inside um, cellophane bag. And we were, we were kind of buying, you know, Nigeria, buying, 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 buying. There, there was one man who went there too. He took like two or three, whatever. He you know, come back to me and said, ah, can you imagine? After grabbing, they start asking, so how do they eat it? So the first thing is to first go and grab before you even, even come and ask. So sometime in, in our spiritual life, a lot of people are just follow, follow. You know, today, a lot of people today are blind. They follow blindly. Um, you know, they, they, they just want to, people go to church without knowing why. Uh, you know, people are ready to hate for something they don't even know. So the same thing. So they began to shout and shout. Then the Jews, they now pushed Alexander in front, in front of them. And some of the crowd shouted instruction to him. Alexander was, was one of their city guys. They oh, yeah, go. He, the motion, he now motion for silence. In order to, to you know to, to make a defense for the people. Now, one thing about that is that I, I, I have um videos I shot where I asked in fact there was one other amphitheater that went in um in in, in Pagamon. It was the steepest amphitheater in, in the ancient world. And I, I asked one disciple to run to go to the stage, and I was at the top of one and just talk naturally. Guess what? I was hearing him. You know, the technology, the wind carries the voice. You know, so the guy motioned people. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, to be there. You know, but, but when they realized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great, it's Artemis of the officials. I want you to imagine you being in old, you know, you know transport, uh, transport in, uh, in England, and they are shouting, ole, 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 for two hours. If the whole city will hear. I was like, the city clerk white in the crowd and said, men of Ephesus, don't you all know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of, 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 of the temple of, of the great Artemis and her image which fell from heaven. Was it? Her image fell from heaven. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet. These guys sounded more like Gamele, the book of Acts. You know what I'm saying? You ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You know why this guy was appealing to them here? He said, you have brought these men here Though they have neither robbed the temple nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius, that's the guy who was the, the, the you know the uh Uluomo of the of, of the gang there, you know, if Demetrius and his fellow crackers men have any grievance against anybody, the courts are open. Also, go to there, there's a magistrate there, they can press their charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it will settle in a legal assembly as it is. Now, as you listen to this, think about what happened with Pilate and Jesus. And that's why I'm going to explain the Pax Romana again. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of this event. In that case, we will not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. And after he has said this, he dismissed the assembly. 
Now, the Pax Romana, there, there are several things that the Roman Empire guaranteed. The Roman peace, for that Roman peace. The station garrison, the station army, um, you know, units all around the entire empire. It's, it's around the entire empire. Number two, they, you know, they constructed roads. In fact, the network of roads, they are still there to today after over 2,000 years. They, you know, all the way from Europe to the Silk Road, all the way to, uh, you know, the, you know go, go, go to China or go to whatever. They constructed road. So what is that significant? That means that horses can play on that road before it was just ordinary sand. You know, the, the wheels can, can jam in sand or in mud or rocky places. They made road and they are the one that invented the interlocking paved stone that we see today. You know, so that means that people can travel faster. Now, that means there was security in the whole empire. And they also cleared all the bandits on the Aegean Sea, Mediterranean Sea. Aegean. So there was no, uh, um, the, 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 you know, there, there was no kidnapping anymore. There was no whatever anymore. And of course, they, they, they give them a common coinage. That means you can have, you can spend the same coin anywhere across the empire. You don't have to change your money. Like we normally do today, you want to go to Ben, you have to go and change to, change your dollar to whatever. They had one currency that they can spend all over the place. They had a postal system where you can mail a letter from one part of the empire and after weeks or months, depending on the distance, whatever, which it will appear on the other empire. They had all this courier service and every single thing. And the law is that every proconsul or every uh, uh, governor must maintain the past Roman. If it is reported that there's a riot Uncle Dobby riots, whatever, they're going to remove you in that place. They're going to black blacklist you and remove you. Of course, being the, being the proconsul or being the governor was wealth. That's where you make money. That's where you make money. And that was why Pilate, when, they, when Pilate now saw that a riot was coming and whatever, ah, he said, wash his hand. I mean, no sense. He didn't want. So the same principle played out here. The guys who were the big men in the city, who were the whatever, said, listen, if they blacklist, you know, this place, they're going to be in trouble. Though. If they hear there's a riot, in this place is going to be very very bad uh you know you know you know for you know, for us so how does all these things play to the church in ephesus in just about six verses just six verses jesus said or rather seven yeah six six verses seven verses i sorry seven verses to the angel of the church in ephesus right these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand Domitian, when Domitian's young son died, Domitian, the, 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 you know, the uh, uh, emperor, uh, Domitian made his baby, his dead baby, a god. And he, he printed a, a commemorative coin for his son. And there, you know, you know the, the son had seven stars, stars around his, his feet. I got. So just like he's saying, and the one who had the seven stars, golden lampstand, and the one that walks between, between the whatever. You know what? If the church is the lampstand, Joker said, I walk amongst you. I know you. That's what I said. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate men, wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. This is good commendation for a church. This excellent combination for a disciple. Think about it. If Christ come and said, my brother, my son, I know your deeds. Because I want one who walks among the seven golden lampstand. I know you when you're sleeping. I know you, when, you, know, you, know, you know, whenever you rise. I know the innermost thoughts that I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. And you have found them to be false. Oh, he said, you have persevered and have not grown I, I, and have endured hardship for my, my name. I have not grown weary. So what is wrong with you know, this church? Yes, Jesus Christ said in verse 4, I hold this against you. So what will Jesus hold against Emmanuel Amen today? What will he hold against my wife? What will he hold against my children? What will he hold against you? What will you hold against your family? What will you hold against your Bible talk? What will you hold against our region, Ikeja? What will you hold against our church? If Christ were to write us a letter today, what will, of course there's going to be comment. He knows us. He knows that we are trying in some ways and whatever. He said, yet I hold against you. He said, you are forsaking your first law. He said, remember the height from which you are falling. Repent and do the things. Repent. 
and do the things you did. Said, what was it? What were they doing at first? He said, if you do not repent, Jesus Christ said, I will come to you and I'll remove your lamb stand from his place. When you remove the lamb stand from, 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 from the temple, you cannot burn the fire, the fire stop. He said, in an ecology way, he said, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You as an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And that's where I got the title from, what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcome, God expects you to overcome. He said, I will give the right to sit, uh, you know, you know, to, sorry, to, to eat from the tree of life. You know, let me give you another scoop. Outside uh, Ephesus, there is actually a grove, a garden with lodge forever. They call it Paradiso, paradise, Paradiso. People go there to go and get the choice they say. Jesus Christ said, listen, if you overcome, I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The paradise of God. So what does Jesus have against the church? They were loveless. They were doing all these things, but there's no heart behind them anymore. They were persevering, but it's no more out of love. Maybe, maybe you are today you are you are you are logged into this uh, you know this Zoom meeting. Or are you here out of love or out of duty? When we come to church, is it out of love or out of duty? When we make contributions to you know you know to support the work of the church, is it out of love or out of duty? When we sing during fellowship, is it out of love or out of duty? What do you do you know today? And what would Jesus Christ call? the things that you do you know, today. So it's very, very important. It's very, very important that we think about it. That's as much as, we, you know, I can say, I'm going to be saying today, uh, you know, sorry, I've taken a little bit of time, uh, but I just wanted to paint that um, inside school. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, in, in next classes, I'm probably going to be showing you the, the founder, the, the, um, the, 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 the Lord of Medicine, and, uh, and some other great archaeological stuff that I brought from there. But I'm going to be handing guys over right now. We're going to say a few words, uh, Sean, but before we go, don't ask yourself, is it out of law, even as you even as you fellowship? God bless you. Amen. Thank you very much for that expository about your trip and uh, the Bible and the, Bible, uh, the book of Revelations. Well, the question is there. What will... Please, if you are not talking, can you mute? You'll be giving permission to talk when it's time for you to talk. So for telling us, and the question remains, what will Jesus hold against me, against my family, against you? So we need to ask ourselves that personal question. And then we have some few minutes, you know, to ask Emmanuel questions or make comments. So if you have any comments or you have questions, please raise up your virtual hand and we'll give you the permission to talk. We have very few minutes, just five minutes. I know this is a thought-provoking lesson. What will Jesus hold against me? Against my Bible talk, against my family? Questions, comments, clarifications. I think some of us need to go to sleep with it and think about it. <laughs> Someone said, thanks, Rabbi Emmanuel. <laughs> okay. All right, since there is no electronic hand raised, so meaning that we are still thinking about the lesson and maybe by next week, we'll have the questions, you know, or comments to give to Emmanuel. Uh, we now continue in this service. Once again, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that. Uh, lead us in the contribution. Miriam, please 
Open your mic, open your video. If you can, the floor is yours. Is Miriam see with us? So, uh, some few minutes ago. Yeah, she is. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm sorry, my the host has this, the host has this, he has this, um, disabled my video. Yeah, we've come to another part of the service where we're going to be having a, a weekly offering. What is, and what is this offering then? It's meant, um, it's meant to take care of the needs of the church. But before I proceed, join me as we read a passage in the book of Acts 20, verse. I showed you how to work. We must help the so There's nothing there. Remembering, the words, remembering the words the Lord gave. Okay. It is more blessed to give than to receive. This was Apostle Paul addressing the elders of the church in Ephesus. He was telling them to remember the word our Lord Jesus Christ told them for them to actually remember that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And looking at it, it is also applicable to us today. I know at times it can be so difficult to give. Like looking at my, taking myself for an example, at times I see myself withholding the little I have from God. A few months back, that was the month of January, I didn't, um, I didn't pay off my monthly contribution. I told myself I was going to carry it over. So along the line, my fiancé had me, was like, have you paid your missions of free and your weekly um, contribution? I told him, I said, well, I just gave a funny excuse. I said, okay, I'm going to pay it over. I'm going to carry it over. Honestly, I didn't have any, I didn't have the plan of paying over. But with the way he spoke to me, he did encourage me to pay, and I'm glad I did. And looking at it, it's all at, at times it can also be difficult for us. I know, and, and so many of us can be like uh, can be like me also. We tend to think about our own needs, about our own world, without us even remembering the people God that actually provides for us. My brothers and my sister, I just want to encourage you all tonight. Let us not be told from God, because the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray. Righteous Father, we thank you, God, for this moment, God, we come before you, God, to give. Please, Father God, may our sacrifices, God, be acceptable to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray, Father God, for those, God, who do not have to give. Please, Father God, encourage the uh, Daddy God, please God, provide for them, God. And, and Father God, let them have a heart of encouragement to give God next time, God. Thank you, Father God, for your word, God, we pray tonight, God. Daddy, we give God the glory. Amen. The account is actually being displayed on the screen. So now, um, when you are paying, you can just indicate what you are paying. Pay for the weekly contribution. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, the account is uh, displayed. For those of us that are not seeing it, it's any bank 1010-361707. Very simple account to memorize. So as you are doing the transfer and uh, whatever we need to do, um, I will yield the floor for Mike Odiaka, who is going to take the few announcements that we have. Over to you, Mike. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Evangelist, for this for the message tonight. Mm. I just have a few announcements here, and uh, that is to remind us once again that this Sunday we'll be meeting at our facility. That's uh, Joby Fele. That's our facility, Kedja facility. And uh, for our friends and family members who might not be able to make it on Sunday, probably because of distance, can also join us via this same link on Sunday, 10 a.m. And uh, if you want a recap of uh, today's um, 
a, a cup of today's um, message, you can just go back to ICOC Kedja. ICOC Kedja, that's our YouTube link. You know, to get a cup of today's message so that uh, the, the class to me, it's a, it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit complicated, but I know this is the, it like um, the opening of uh, a class for the month of, um, of month of April. So for us to get this properly, if you don't understand it, you can kindly just go back to ICUC Kedja and you get the message there. And uh, also, I want to remind us for uh, this uh, program, Autism, Autism for Autism. You know, children, if you have children who are autistic, you can just take them for this. Uh, it's going to be shared, the flyer will be shared on our platform. You know, and this is tomorrow, but it's going to be on Zoom. So probably maybe after tonight's service, check if you're interested to, to be part of this program. You check immediately after service tonight on our platform. You will see the flyer there with the Zoom link boldly written under it. So you can join tomorrow. Tomorrow is virtual, you know, to be part of this uh, seminar. Um, I think uh, that is all I have for tonight. And all, I guess this week is for the teens party. So I guess the teens, I hope you are all prepared this weekend. And that the fee once again is 3,000 naira. Thank you and God bless you all. All right, thank you, Mike, for the announcements. And if there are any other announcements, well, we shall display it on uh, on our portals, on our WhatsApp portals, as time goes on. And I also think there is going to be an auto maturity class. Is it starting this Sunday? It's going to be an auto maturity class. I'm not sure about the details of that, but we'll put it on on our portal as well for those that have graduated from uh, the the initial class forgot in their class now i don't have the details but we'll put it on our portals without wasting much time we just go ahead manuel once again thank you for a very wonderful class let us start asking ourselves that question what will god hold against me what will god hold against my family my family group my bible talk who will go hold against me in even in my office what have I been doing? Yeah, thank you very much. People that have graduated from the equipping class, thank you, Stella, you know, to the onto maturity, you know. So uh, you know that uh, the onto maturity class will start very soon. So we'll continue uh, in the lessons. Let's not forget that Easter is around the corner. Friday is public holiday. This is the time that we normally use to reach out to our friends and our families. You know, Easter, some people, they come to church during Easter and during Christmas. So this is the time to invite them to church and then come and listen to what God has in stock for us on Sunday. You know, the Easter Sunday service. So without wasting much time, I will invite Karen Anolefo, who will be giving us the closing prayers. Go ahead, Madam Karen. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Do I need to switch on my video? Go ahead. Okay. Um, it's been a great time listening to um, Emmanuel with all the expository, everything. I know that I was on the road while uh, the message was going on and all that, I just go back to my workshop. So let's pray. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for the, for the time. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for, for today. We thank you, God, that uh, we are alive. We well, thank you, God, that we made it till the evening of today. It's been a very remarkable day. It's been a very busy day. It's been... Um, you know, all kinds of things, but a very productive one at that. Father, thank you so much, God, more than anything else for the fact, you know, that uh, Emmanuel could, you know, have this kind of expository and, 
um, very impacting indeed, you know, accounts of his journey, you know, of his so many journeys that he has made. This in particular, just bringing home, you know, most of the things that we have seen in the Bible in terms of, um, I mean, the things that we have seen in the scriptures and things we have heard that happened in the ancient past. And in bringing them to life, just seeing those graphics, looking at the pictures, seeing him standing, you know, uh, behind those different structures, you know, that tells a lot of messages and tells a lot of uh, convictions to our hearts. Just seeing him standing there and talking, you know, about the things that, that he saw, the things that he, he now knows about and the experiences that he's had. It's so, so very, very impacting and interesting. Thank you, Father, for your word that is so true. Thank you for your word that is very, 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 very much, you know, food for our soul. We thank you, God, that uh, we are able to take it and we're able, Father God Almighty, to, you know, build convictions based on this teaching, based on those things, God, that, uh, that we continue to see every week, God. Thank you for Emmanuel that um, has taught us today for all the different things he taught. Father, help us, God, to continue to gain deeper convictions and uh, that even it, these things will not be lost on us as we listen to them every single week, that uh, we continue to build our faith as well and continue to grow spiritually. So that even when we're studying the Bible with our friends and we're trying to convince people, there's so much, you know, we have learned in the past weeks, you know, that uh, we can use further to, to convince people about the kingdom of God. Thank you for our families. Thank you for, you know, um, our children, even for the teenagers that will be having an event this weekend. God, Father, we commit them into your hands. I know that they are looking forward to it. They're excited. They finished their exams. So it's just a good time to, you know, unwind and relax and really enjoy themselves. Thank you, God, for all the parents who have paid. Thank you, God, for even the parents who will still pay or pay some extra Father Lord God Almighty so that they can have, you know, really have a, a fun time and have a great time, God. I pray for all the children in the kids' kingdom. I pray for the singles. I pray for the marrieds. I pray for everyone, every category, even those of us who do, you know, some, some you know, work in church for usher, the ushers, for, for those of us who sing in the choir. There's so much. People who come early, you know, to clean the, 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 the chairs and make sure that the place is, you know, good enough for us to have a service for those in the sound room, those who, you know, give the message for those in the in the team that make all the announcements and all that, every single person who is involved in coordination and everything, Father, please be with us. Every single day as we go out there, we meet a lot of challenges, God, life challenges. I pray, Father God Almighty, that you help us every single day to be strong. Help us every single day to just be able to overcome these challenges, God, that we meet so that we continue to grow strong as disciples of your son, Jesus Christ. I know that for us women, we're really talking about evangelism and reaching out. You know, we have um, some, uh, I mean, uh, invitations that have been given to us. Father, please help us to put it to good use. Help us, those of us who will be having meetings with, our, I mean, the family group leaders, women that will be having meetings with our other women, our team members. Father, help us to have this meeting so that we can come up with, you know, we can deliberate and come up with good decisions that will move God's kingdom forward. Thank you for everything. Thank you, God, for tonight, even as we go to sleep, Father, please protect us and um, keep us, guide us, God, you know, against everything, Father, Lord God Almighty, that you've always guided us against and protected us against, God. Be with us. Be with our families, our children, our husbands, our wives. Every single one of us is in Jesus' mighty and everlasting name we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you all. The end of the day, we have 42 going to 41 in attendance. Have a great evening, everyone. Everyone. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.
Good night, y'all. Good night, everyone.